And uh, our last speaker, last but not least, uh, Dr. Stephen Veltries is a professor in the Mechanical Engineering Department at McMaster University and the director of the McMaster Manufacturing Research Institute, or MMRI. Through his involvement in MMRI, Dr. Veltries has worked with many researchers and industrial partners on leading edge manufacturing technologies, specifically targeting machining. His research areas of interest are quite vast uh, and include continuous improvement through lean, process modeling, sensor integration, industrial Internet of Things, uh, uh, AI, machine learning, all of which are applied to realize higher levels of digitization on the shop floor. With that, uh, let's welcome Professor Veltwis. All right, thank you, Mahal. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to join you here today. Um, so the MMRI is a member of the Advanced Manufacturing Consortium and we're working together with uh, Western and Waterloo and collectively we're focused on training and advancing the state of manufacturing in Canada. And uh, I'll just work through our slides. So just in terms of how we're approaching manufacturing, I would say manufacturing is complicated. Those that are involved in it know that. And so our approach is a very integrated one. So what we've been doing is really looking at taking knowledge of material science, uh, both new material developments, material characterization and material properties. And then on the other end, looking at um, products and how they're used. And then in between, we, we fit in manufacturing and that's where my interests lie. And what we're really looking to do is integrate those together to come up with better solutions and really drive uh, productivity, which would be a major element in uh, Canada. So a lot has been said about productivity in Canada, and you could imagine it's something we really need to work on. And it, when you think about it, it's really just a very simple ratio of uh, output over input. And I would say historically, we've focused considerably on uh, the input side. We've really been using a lot of lean tools to try to drive out waste and to reduce cost. And it's really allowed us to, to achieve volume of uh, productivity, our volume of production. And we've been able to reach critical scale in many cases where we've really been able to contribute to, to industries, automotive, aerospace in particular. So one of the things that I would really like to emphasize today is the importance of focusing on the output side and things that we can do with data and it's often bundled together with machine learning or now oftentimes uh, artificial intelligence. But all of these together, we're, we're really trying to use data to drive better decisions. And so what can we be doing to augment lean with data? And as David pointed out this morning, AI is a journey and many have said that about lean as well. And so now, you know, to me, leveraging some new data sources, some new data analytics tools to really drive lean capability. And so we want to be able to do that in the context of, of really targeting output now as well. So really looking at high valued goods and services, trying to drive um, higher price margins on those items, targeting parts with higher quality expectations, and one of the things that I would really focus on is the fact that we can leverage manufacturing capability to drive innovation. And I, I would say that was one of the main points that was missed probably in the early 2000s when everybody was trying to send manufacturing offshore. They forgot the fact that manufacturing is really embedded in that innovation process. And if we don't uh, get engaged with manufacturing, we lose a lot of that ability to innovate. So what are some of the key differentiators that we should be looking at and what, which ones create opportunities for us in terms of high value added parts? I would say a lot of the exotic high temperature aerospace alloys, um, those are very difficult to, to process. And if we can develop expertise in those, then that really um, positions us well. Also parts with really demanding quality targets. So either it's a surface finish expectation or some kind of residual stress target that we need to be able to, to hit. Those are significant challenges and they take real expertise to hit. Other ones where we see a lot of opportunities are in high volume production. When you think about it, if we can achieve a real competitive advantage on making a part, we can supply that globally through the networks and the trade agreements that Canada has signed. 
And yeah, we, we've demonstrated our ability to pivot over the past year, just in terms of production of PPE. And uh, in, in our case, we did a lot of work on testing supplies and bringing those out to, uh, to the testing centers. So th there's a lot related to automation, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about stable production as well and robust processes. We've done a lot of work in the area of prescriptive maintenance and trying to pull that into this realm to get higher uptime on production equipment. And then also really looking at the ability to tune a process while still achieving production levels. So yeah, I would say a big part of this is leveraging Canada's resources, Canada's highly trained personnel, and then also the manufacturing infrastructure that's here and really realizing a lot of these opportunities through that. So there's been a lot of talk about automation and I, I think that's good. The challenge though is trying to prepare a process for automation. And so when we work with companies on, on trying to automate a process, I'd say the first step is really focusing on the process, understanding the process, ensuring that the process is robust. And a lot of the processes that we get involved with are machining related. And some of the things that can be significant problems are burr formation or even just swarf management. And both of those are side, side effects of what we're actually trying to achieve. So we're trying to drill a hole, but we end up producing a burr. If we produce a burr, we can't inspect that part the same way. We may not be able to handle it the same way. So all of those are big issues when you're trying to introduce automation. And so we've really focused on those aspects in order to prepare processes so that they're far easier to automate. And Canada has a wide range of automation companies and, and really leads in that space. So bringing a process to the point that it's robust and repeatable really aligns it well with automation. Another thing that I would just like to highlight is some of the work that we've been doing in materials. So developing materials with what we would refer to as self-protective properties. So we're trying to, um, under processing conditions and for manufacturing, that's typically high temperature, heavy load, we generate surfaces that um, have oxides, nitrides, and generally those are very hard wear resistant, in some case, lubricious, thermally protecting, oxidation resistant surfaces. And so by tuning the oxide, we can actually get a very specific performance from that surface. And so we've been doing that a lot with cutting tools, trying to develop higher performing tools and really targeting difficult to cut materials. So what are some of the materials that if, if we can machine this material in volume, can we introduce that material into a product? enhance its performance, its efficiency, and overall really drive that, that output side of productivity, that value side. So when we look at Industry 4.0, I would say that's the banner under which a lot of the, the new data type analytics is coming under. And so it draws together Internet of Things, machine learning, AI. And one of the things that I would really emphasize is the importance when we introduce something new, we really need to target the problems that we face. So it's not a case of going out and, and just applying these technologies to your facility. I would really encourage you to go out, look for problems, look for data sources that will help you drive better decision making. And one of the important things that, that I would really encourage you to develop as you build that out is leveraging your domain expertise. So there's a lot of discussion around the data and around the analytics, but from our experience, the real um, element that's important is the domain expertise that your company already has, the ability to take that data and apply it in a way that solves problems and adds value. And we've done that in two ways within our, our research group. So we've been looking at building out prescriptive maintenance and then also kind of that self-tuning uh, in real time where you're trying to optimize process parameters, introduce changes. So just to walk through those with you in terms of prescriptive maintenance, uh, as David pointed out this morning, there's uh, an evolution going on in, in a lot of these different areas and maintenance is, is one of them. So you can imagine in the past, uh, corrective maintenance, something breaks, you deploy the team, they fix it, they're heroes, and everything's up and running again. A um, little bit more planning, a little bit more forethought, you can do preventative maintenance where you set schedules and you replace things as needed. 
over time. And, and unfortunately, one of the things that happens is you replace things potentially before they're fully worn out. And then predictive maintenance, where you're beginning to collect data and you're trying to drive decisions now on, on when you should replace something. The next level of that, and some of this is semantics, so it's it's really just an offshoot of predictive maintenance, but starting to engage the processes, integrating across your organization to really drive better decisions, better timing, integrate with materials, uh, with shipping, integrate with uh, labor to ensure that the right people are there. So all of that coming together to really drive a better outcome in terms of productivity. And that's something that the data allows us to do. And when we integrate across these platforms, we're able to drive that kind of improvement. On the self-tuning side, we're starting to look a lot more at um, introducing subtle changes into a process and using data to understand how that's impacting productivity, quality, cost. And, and you can imagine, you've got to integrate this all together. So you, the day you introduce that change, you might have another change on incoming material and you might have a 5% improvement hidden in there, but it could be hidden by 10% uh, problem with material. And so you really need good statistics to go in there and search through that in order to find that 5%. And if you can consistently implement a 5% improvement on a regular basis, you can have a really big impact on your, your overall organization. And so we've been looking at ways now to start implementing small changes. And for example, the tooling that we've been developing, it's one thing for it to perform well in the lab under really controlled conditions, but how does it perform in production when, when there's a lot of variability and a lot of uh, factors that are not controlled as tightly as in a lab? And so we wanna be able to monitor those and track them and be able to relate them statistically in a meaningful way to, to whether that change was an improvement or not. So the other thing that we've been developing is a lot more platforms. So within the manufacturing sector, there's legacy equipment, there's new equipment that you're able to purchase which has a lot more uh, interface uh, capability to it, data communication built into it. But how do you build that highway for data to flow through that? So we've been working with a number of partners on that. So the larger companies, Fanuc, uh, Siemens, and, and many of the others all have data structures like that. So we've been working within those organization structures to, to start integrating some of our data streams into that. So not only are we pulling data from within the machine that the machine can access, we're introducing um, other sensors to collect data about the process. And you can imagine it's oftentimes very difficult to directly measure a parameter that, that's important in a process. So we oftentimes have to build fairly complex models and measure parameters that are somewhat removed from the, the technology that we're interested in. So we also need to be able to integrate it to, to take action on that. And so you might have an interface to a robot, you might have other PLC um, equipment that uh, is controlling uh, conveyors and, and other processes and timing them and, and considering rework and all of those things. And you, you need to be able to integrate that all together and be able to have a database where that data is now accessible. And as uh, David alluded to this morning, it, it's one thing to have data, but you need to have organized data and you need to be able to understand what that data means. So oftentimes you have large strings of numbers and, and you need to really be able to understand what they mean in the context of your process. And that's where I go back to saying domain expertise is a critical element of this. You need to be able to develop within your team the experts who understand the data, who understand the problems and who can fully implement the solution. And so I think that was kind of one of the big lessons that we've really learned through all of our experience with um, implementing data analytics. So just looking at, you know, now how do we take that data and start presenting it? So just charts of data that are presented to the operator, to different levels of uh, management and coordination, trying to really understand what action can be taken in order to ensure productivity remains strong and that uh, quality is, is meeting objectives. So we need to be able to display that data in a way that people can action. 
And that, that's a really important aspect of this. You could imagine um, going forward, some of that data feeding into algorithms where there's recommendations being made. And over time, as you build confidence in that, you can start implementing those recommendations in a more automated sense. But again, I, I would say each one of those is an important step in that journey towards implementation. So th this is an example that we did a while back. We implemented a production process. We um, collected parts. We inspected those parts. We tracked the performance of those parts. And over time, we were able to identify the errors, track the errors, and update the machine controls interface uh, through a simple, um, in this case, it was very simple ethernet, but just looking at uh, updating the control parameters for the, the tool offset. And interesting, if we just look at the normal variation in blue that's experienced throughout the day, you can see considerable variation is underlying in that process. You have breaks going on, you have uh, lunch breaks where an operator is not maybe as attentive. You have a considerable thermal uh, drift within this process. So the machine starts out cool in the morning and it takes quite a while to warm up and run in a stable manner. If you just tried to run like this, you, you would have to have a high degree of uh, attendance to be able to track this and you would be making um, considerable updates to the process. So in this case, it had a, an objective of uh, plus or minus 10 microns, which was very tight for this kind of process. And what we needed to be able to do was implement this degree of monitoring to drive it to within that green band in order to have good stable production. So another thing that we've spent a lot of time on is, is understanding these processes, building up that domain expertise when you can't necessarily interact with the process. So we've been doing a lot of modeling work and interestingly enough, Canada has a real strength in this area. Um, I'm a, one of the members of a large consortium that focuses on machining called CanRIMT. It's headed by Yosef Altintis out of the University of British Columbia. But there's a, quite a number of universities across Canada that are participating in that and in developing out that domain expertise that really underlies a lot of the improvements that we're looking at. So um, can we simulate a machining operation in a computer? Can we understand the impact of changes? Can we try to drive some of the process parameters into a sweet spot where we got a really high level of productivity that's possible? So just to kind of wrap up some of the activities uh, how we bring this together, we've really been focusing on a lot of industry projects. So really going out, identifying problems and resourcing them to the point that they're solved and implemented. So in the past year, we've been doing about 200 of those with about 60 industry partners. We've started taking some of our prescriptive maintenance um, technology and we're now implementing that in large scale. In this case, it's an automotive OEM. Uh, production facility and we've now got it embedded on just about every rotating asset in, in one of their uh, divisions and collecting data from that and, and making recommendations with regards to the condition and then the follow-up maintenance activity. So our group's going to be growing. We'll be expanding over to the uh, innovation park and uh, yeah, there's quite a number of mechanisms that are available to to interact with us on that. We've also consolidated a lot of that into a training program, so that's available as well. And uh, I see Mihail has joined us, so that wraps up my presentation, and uh, I would look forward to any questions. Thank you so much, so Professor Valtis, for sharing your insights into research on high-performance manufacturing and machining. And uh, as you have highlighted, significant challenges remain uh, in these fields. Uh, so there are two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what are the difficulties in terms of technology transfer of research outcomes, specifically in the area of automation or controls of, uh, for, of machining processes? Yeah, I would say there's a lot of reports that are generated that just sit on a shelf. And so what we have found is we need to be able to, to support companies as they implement those uh, technologies. So. Not only now are we developing a report, but we're working with them on implementation. So we've developed a number of staff who work closely with staff members at companies 
and uh, implement that. And that was largely uh, driven by uh, the Ontario AMC program. And so that's been supporting that uh, for a period of time now. Thank you. And um, following that, I hope I, uh, I was able to translate the question from, from the Q&A well. Uh, how can workers integrate they, their knowledge in automated tools uh, as it is often not transparent on how maybe how they may be able to do uh, so? Yeah, so I would go back to we've really focused on problems and uh, drawing resources around solving that problem and then focusing on implementing it. So I, I think problems is a language that, that people speak on the shop floor. They oftentimes they're very familiar with putting resources to it and, uh, and addressing it. And so we've really targeted our efforts around that about collecting the data that relates to problems, working with companies on understanding what it means within their operation. And then uh, typically there's, there's resources that are at say Waterloo, Western McMaster in this case, that, that we would apply and, and try to really shed light on that problem and try to bring in the industry partners to, to participate in that. And so they have a better understanding of that technology. So then when it comes to implementation, they're really integrated into that solution and, uh, and are able to move it forward quickly. So I hope that answers the question. I hope so, I think, yeah. I think so, thank you. All right. Uh, perfect. So uh, if possible at this time, I would like to invite our speakers to turn the ca their cameras back on. And uh, on behalf of the organizers of the event, I would like to extend our appreciation to Professor Tersirkani, Professor Melek, and Professor Valthuis for taking the time to share their research activities. Uh, this was really a good window into advanced R&D um, for additive manufacturing, robotics, high performance uh, manufacturing and machining. And uh, I would like to thank everyone on the line for your interest and engagement. And uh, I would like to also take this opportunity to invite everyone to continue the discussion during the networking and virtual trade show part of the event. Thank you all so much for your participation and your attention. And again, thank you to all of our speakers once again.